He was a comet. He was there for an instant, lit up the entire universe, and then he was gone. I finished the third act, and I'm streaming tears. This is the greatest play since Death of a Salesman. We would walk down a street, and there'd be hundreds of people who would mob him because he's now, you know, one of the biggest stars in the world. Nothing will kill you quicker than success. Failure, you can have all your life. I might have enjoyed the idea of the boy who could have been but never was. Major funding was provided for Miller's Tale by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by... This is my hometown, Scranton, Pennsylvania. While I was growing up here, Scranton was known for two things, coal mines and Jason Miller, a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright who also happened to star in one of the scariest movies ever made. Jason Miller had a meteoric rise to fame and then almost as quickly seemed to disappear. Jason ended up back here in Scranton. He was the local boy made good, turned tragic hero. It seems like everyone in this town has a story about Jason Miller. Well, this is mine. Twenty-five years after making The Exorcist, Jason Miller agreed to act in my first student film. You can go home now. He didn't want anything in return, just a TV on set so he could watch the Notre Dame game. This was the last time I saw Jason. A few years later, he died of a heart attack in his favorite local bar. And while Hollywood turned out to mourn the loss of a great talent in Jason Miller, people from Scranton also mourning the loss of a beloved native son. Ah, he was an exasperating, aggravating man. <laughs> and an uh, extraordinarily sensitive, vulnerable man, too. And I so much saw that he didn't take care of himself. And that's the exasperating, aggravating. His mission on this earth wasn't, wasn't done yet. He was a wonderful man. And like I said, really, it did good for Scranton here. We don't have too many celebrities, but he was really one of a kind. Jason traded in a life in Hollywood for a humble life in Scranton among family and friends. I was just a kid when he returned but I remember how he was received like a hero. Jason Miller is back in town, you know, and everybody wanted to, like, touch him and stuff, you know, just to, for good luck, maybe. Why did this incredible playwright, who experienced such explosive beginnings, never write a Broadway play again? And what happened to Jason in Hollywood that would make him run away? 
I mean, Jason was bigger than life. Actually, here's like here's this kid from Westside, and like look what he has done. A very humble guy. A lot of people flocked him, you know, to his table. But he himself walk in, hi, how are you? Like any other customer, you'd never think he's a famous man. Like that much about him a lot. I don't like to talk about it as if he was a failure. Never, never say that about Jason. He was the best thing that ever came out of this town. Scranton is an old coal town. It was once one of the wealthiest cities in the country until the industry collapsed. There's an old joke that there's a bar or a church on every corner. And it's not far from the truth. Jason had plans to become a priest until he discovered the theater. He went to Catholic University in Washington, D.C., where he met his first wife, Linda Gleason. Her father, Jackie Gleason, didn't come to their wedding in Scranton. Apparently, he didn't think Jason would ever amount to much. Jason and Linda moved to New York and struggled for many years. Jason took odd jobs and acted in this police training film. The officer treats this violent boy with the same patient consideration he shows to others. His goal was to become a playwright. But his first play, Nobody Hears a Broken Drum, bombed. I wasn't sorry when I did it, but I was really sorry after. His second play caught the attention of the legendary producer, Joseph Papp, who agreed to stage it. The original cast included Paul Servino, who became Jason's lifelong friend. The sculpting that I do is not Paul Servino is a well-known actor, totally singer, and painter. But it's his lesser-known stature as a sculptor that brought him back to Scranton this week, that and his love and respect for the late Jason Miller. Servino is donating his talents to create a bust of Miller as a permanent memorial, a memorial he says is richly deserved. The commissioners envision putting the tribute to Miller somewhere here on the Adams Avenue side of the Lackawanna County Courthouse, just about a block away from the apartment he had for many years. There are some costs involved, and Commissioner Bob Cordero is hoping the people of Scranton will support that tribute to Miller. We are going to be asking for volunteer donations because this process is going to cost uh, between twelve and twenty thousand dollars. Sorvino hopes to have a sculptor ready by this June or July. Jason's path. That's he lived in the Brooks building there, as you know. And he would go across the street or across the square. Yep. The Farley's. Uh, and then the bust will be in here and, and inside just a little bit. We want it close enough so that both the driver by and the casual passerby notices it. And then something next to it, much like the historic uh, markers, which describes maybe a little bit more in detail. It seemed like a perfect place to memorialize Jason, but not everyone in Scranton agreed. That is not the place to place a memorial, not at the uh, courthouse square, in my opinion. The courthouse should be reserved for veterans, people who actually serve their country in the military. 
I went to visit Paul Servino in order to ask him what he saw in Jason that made him worthy of a bust. Hi. Hi, how are you? And uh, everything is dusty because we've just been doing construction in here. So have you started working on the sculpture of Jason yet? I started one and abandoned it. It wasn't going right. I wasn't fully prepared. I think I had to get out of the way uh, just to, that he's not on the planet anymore. I think I had to get that off my mind and out of me emotionally. And now I'm ready to do it with more dispassionately. Uh, Don't look. <laughs> all I saw, all I remember is the face in the blackness of the theater. And there, there was just a work light on, so you could almost, I, he was just looking at me, you know, like this, you know. Not hostily, just looking at me. I said, who the hell is that? So what a depth to this person. They gave me the script and I took it back and it is my habit. I started reading it, walking down the steps. And the, the opening is sensational. First two pages, I get to the parking lot, I get my car, and I'm reading in stoplights. I pull over, I finish the third act, and I'm streaming tears. And I said, this is the greatest play since Death of a Salesman. If I do this play in New York, I will become a star in one night. And uh, that's what happened. That championship season opened off Broadway and became an overnight sensation. The play is set in Scranton. It's about a high school basketball team that reunites with their coach 24 years after winning a state championship. Over the course of the night, they come to realize they're all hanging on to their one great success in life, their championship season. It was a critical and financial success and for a while, when people mentioned Miller on Broadway, they weren't referring to Arthur. Pulitzer Prizes announced today in the arts included the Drama Award to Jason Miller for his play entitled That Championship Season. The play went on to win every major award for drama. I mean, if anything would remind me of Jason, it would be downtown Scranton, like downtown Scranton, where he always was. Say you were just walking to the Rite Aid, you would see Jason. Say you were walking to Scanlon's, you would see Jason. If you were walking over to the po federal post office, you would see Jason. You know what I mean? Like, he was just a man about town. A lot of people wrote into the newspapers in Electric City, slamming him, praising him. My favorite one was a gentleman said that they should put a monument in the courthouse square so pigeons can go and shit on it. Because, you know, shit on Jason Miller. Like, who was he? What is he all, you know what I mean? Why, why are they making such a big deal about a man that did nothing but drink? This is basically what the article said. It said it was a, a worthless idea and it was a worthless thing to do to even, you know, do anything for this guy because he was just what he was. He was an alcoholic. I appreciated him for what he did for me. <laughs> After my parents split, you know what I mean? There was, I, I really didn't look up to a lot of people. And then I met him. And not only that, but I, I mean, I was, I was doing theater, and here's a guy who's a man in Scranton, and he just gets the biggest kick out of it. And he loved me. I really, truly, and honestly feel that he loved me. I felt that he, he, he appreciated me and he loved me for what I did. And he knew that I felt the same way about him. And that's why I think that we got along so well. If you really looked at who he was, you wouldn't put him on a pedestal, but you definitely respect him.
Were you aware um, that recently they were uh, they were trying to to put a, a memorial to Jason downtown in the courthouse like square area? Talk about the ruckus that it raised and the paper and stuff. You know, this area is well, so hard to get you know, anything statue. done. You got statues of yeah. miners around because mining was such a big thing to this area. Well, what's the difference? You know, he's a theatrical person. Right? Yeah. And the guy was the first achievement of the city since coal. So around here, like, some people were like, oh, wow, it's so great he was here. And then other people in retrospect were like, oh, he drank his life away and stuff like that. And so, I mean, this is definitely like a working drinking man's area and especially since there's no jobs there's more drinking going on than working and so I mean he already had that value in him and I mean you know I think it's unfair for people to judge him for that because the thing was he was drinking in Scranton instead of sniffing coke in Hollywood you know what I mean so I, I, I don't know I don't, I don't see much of a moral conundrum there you know I think it's great that they're going to memorialize them here. I think it brighten up the downtown and show that Scranton is kind of cultural, you know, and not just about industry. Something almost beyond comprehension is happening to a girl on this street, in this house. And a man has been sent for as a last resort. This man is the exorcist. In 1973, Jason Miller was 33 years old. That championship season had just opened on Broadway to rave reviews, but even that was overshadowed by what came next. I first became aware of Jason while I was in New York during the casting period of The Exorcist. One day I saw an article in the New York Times and it had a picture of Jason Miller. It said that Jason had gone to Catholic University and studied for the priesthood, Jesuit school, for three years. And that really piqued my attention. And I said, you know, I'd like to meet the guy that wrote this play. And Jason Miller came up one afternoon, and he had not heard of The Exorcist. He was wound like a spring. I guess he had just had this enormous success with the opening of the play that he had written, and it was new to him, success. And we started to talk, and we were very uncomfortable with each other. The next day, I get a call from Jason. And he said, hey, you know, uh, that character, Father Karras, he said, that's me. And I said, well, no, it isn't you, because we've just cast so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, he said, no, no, he said, you're making a mistake. He said, I know this guy. I know this role. And there were a lot of people who called me about playing this role. One was Jack Nicholson, and another was Paul Newman. But I wanted someone who would be believable in a priest outfit. And there was just something about his persistence that I admired. So I said, well, let's do a screen test. Gave the cup to his disciples and said, take this. All of you and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood. The next day I saw the rushes. The camera really loved him. And so I had cast Ellen Burstyn. She said, well, this guy can't play Father Karras. He may be something of a natural, but he's not an actor. And I told Bill Blatty, who had written the script and was the producer of The Exorcist, I said, you know what? I'm going to do the film with this guy. And the head of the studio called me into his office and said, you can't do this. What are you talking about? And I said, no, you, you got to trust me. I really believe in this guy. I think he's the real deal. And so with Burston against him and Blatty and the studio, I decided to tough it out and go forward. And the more they objected, the more it convinced me that that's the way I should go. Your mother's in here with his cars. Would you like to leave a message? 
I see the chick has it. If that's true, then you must know my mother's maiden name. What is it? What is it? A movie based on a best-selling book has stirred up incredible interest, controversy, and debate in this country. It deals in a vivid, horrible way with witchcraft, devils, and the occult. The Exorcist, in case you haven't seen it, and I hope you haven't, is a cheap movie made from a cheap, bad novel. Movie? It's a social phenomenon. There may be more people muttering about The Exorcist than about Watergate or energy or anything. It could become, they say, the greatest grossing movie ever made. Long after the film premiered, we would walk down a street in New York, Fifth Avenue, let's say, to go eat somewhere, and there'd be hundreds of people who would mob him and say, Father, you got to help me. My son, my daughter. And he would try to pull away, and he'd say, I I'm just an actor. I I'm just an actor. You know, and he had to sometimes get really uh, heavy to get away from people because he's now, you know, one of the biggest stars in the world. Uh, famous relatives for 600, please. Jason Patrick, who almost became a vampire in The Lost Boys, is the son of this movie exorcist. Eric. Who is Max von Sydow? No. Jane or Ron? Jane. Who is Jason Miller? You got it. Joining me now, Jason Patrick, your father. Influential in you? In, yes. Call it a prize winning playwright. Uh huh. Main, mainly in the sense of uh, material, interpretation of material. You know, it was a fabulous play, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. That championship season. It's, you know, one of those sort of magical American plays, you know, and I think it, you know, will always go down that way. Jason Patrick was seven years old when his parents divorced. He didn't see his father much after that. Close to him? Yeah, but very different, you know? I mean, we're just, uh, you know, our paths are very different. He declined an interview for my film, but his brother Jordan invited me to his home in New Jersey. Jordan? Hi. But this is my brother and I and my dad put probably or the first picture with us together in almost uh, 20 years, I'll say. This is the first time you guys had all been together in all 20 together, years? All together, all three of us together, yeah. My brother and my father just sort of had a, a falling out at one time, and I sort of accepted in a lot of ways that he was, I mean, he loved his kids, but he really wasn't the father type. I think we have to dust Jack. He hasn't been polished in a while. I'm watching the Yankee game. They're down. I'll take him down, give him a good rub to bring the team back. My father had given me a ring of St. Christopher while I put it on his finger before he went into the furnace. My brother had a... a necklace he put it in there julia put an earring in there we're all in there together to the end jason moved to california after the exorcist was released he found new love in a young actress named susan bernard she grew up in hollywood and she credits herself with being the first jewish virgin in playboy this was like the original old Hollywood. Cecil B. DeMille had a screening room in his house like a few blocks away. The Chandlers live across the street. They started the LA Times. It's like old, it was first old Protestant money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and just think about a Jewish family moving in to the area, you know. It's just, just like fragments of my life and the Pulitzer Prize and Jason won and 
That's when Jason uh, was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. This is a picture of Jason and I uh, when he came out to, um, mm -hmm. to California. That's when we were in our prime. <laughs> we always said, oh, when we're old and gray and no one wants us, we'll, we'll definitely take care of each other. <laughs> But I guess we didn't keep our, he didn't keep his promise, so what can we do? Oh, here's a picture of Josh and me. I always keep that on my desk. Susan and Jason never married. They had a child together. Their son, Josh, is a writer, and he still lives in California. My father lived in Malibu, and I saw him a lot when I was a kid. But honestly, when other things like and when other things became a priority to him, such as, as he would call it, the Lana Turner thing, you know, fame, you know, like your face and all that recognition and, and him sort of diving into that world of drugs and alcohol and the whole Malibu scene. He was offered Taxi Driver and he didn't want to do another dark, violent movie. So he turned it down and decided to do this movie called Nickel Ride, which was a more risky role and risky film. And my mom was like, don't do it, don't do it. And then Nickel Ride bombed. And he couldn't handle the defeat. Because, you know, he was so high and he dropped so low. That's a fall. That's a long fall. I think what happens. First his father dies. Then his girl leaves him flat. Then there's an appearance by the father's ghost. Jason's acting career seemed to end after The Exorcist, but he acted in over two dozen other films. Oh, no. We were on our way to Panama. With the right kind of luck, I figured we were only uh, two days from the canal. Some of them were good and some of them were really bad. I found out that Jason had a manager while he was in Hollywood. His name is Jay Bernstein, and he's managed actors like Drew Barrymore and Farrah Fawcett. Yeah, I always thought he was gonna be like the next Humphrey Bogart, because he's got those lines in his face. He's well known by his nickname, the Star Maker. Okay, call her okay now. What I'd like to do, sir, is just like to be shot from this side. Mm -hmm. Could you tell him? So was Jason a star while he was in Hollywood? On one hand, I would say definitely. On the other hand, I'd say no. Because he did nothing star-like and hid from it, that's why I mean, he never went to a Hollywood party, never did any of the things that the stars did. And I think that hurt him. I didn't work with him as he was winning the Pulitzer Prize or the Academy Award nomination. I was a part of helping him adjust as best he could to the top of the mountain. You know, of all those other movies he did at that time, nothing was very impressive. So he was just talent with a capital T that had pain with a capital P. And he got too much too soon. He was a good friend of mine, a good friend of this city. I do not want to be involved in any controversy over where the bus goes or what it is. And they could put the damn thing on wires for all that joke. And I hear people say disparaging things about Jason Miller. You know, how many Pulitzer Prizes have they won? Right. How many times have they been out of yeah, yeah, yeah. How many Emmys have they won? You know, they, you know, all they do is they talk bad about somebody, they try to knock people down. This town doesn't need that. We have enough of that. That's right. But we should all get together and just, like a night like tonight and any other nights that they have parties like this to remember them, to thank God that Jason Miller walked this way. I 
mean, they're not doing anybody any good by putting something here that the majority of people in Lackawanna County don't want. He died by himself with his girlfriend. Right over there, Farley. I'll show you the bar stool he fell off of. You think it's going to set a bad example for the kids if they put a memorial up to him? He obviously couldn't make it in Hollywood or he would have stayed there. Right? So why did he come back here? He was a drug addict, an alcoholic, and a bum. Okay? Can't take away the Pulitzer Prize. I mean, he was a good actor. That was here. You weigh it against all the other stuff, it doesn't even out. So, what do you do? Hollywood, it's a tough town because it is a business. There's a lot of uh, pressure uh, on star system. There's a big star system. Uh, there's an A-list, a B-list, a C-list, a no-list at all. Jason was intensely shy. Being thrust in the spotlight made him very uncomfortable. The painting of Jason, it was the first time that I met him. So it was 1971, and he came over to me and he said, I'm writing a play, and there's nothing in it for you. There are no women's parts, but give me your phone number anyway. <laughs> and so I complied, and that began this extraordinary relationship. Um, I remember there was like a period of a couple of months when I didn't see him. Came home and I got this telephone call, and it was him. And he said, um, I have something very important to ask you. And I thought, this is it. You know, he's going to ask me to marry him. I know it. And um, so I went running over to his house with the wings of love. We're sitting there on the beach, and it's just like a movie. And he takes my hand, and he said, I'm getting married. <laughs> and I remember it was just like, could you just run that by me again, pal? You're what? You know, just a couple of months, I don't see him. <laughs> And he's getting married. <laughs> With a person like Jason, it is like trying to catch the wind. And we're going to do five television shows. I was telling our stage manager about Jason Miller, and I wrote a category about him for Jeopardy, and he said, oh. And he, and he started naming different things he'd done. Oh, he was a playwright, and he became a famous actor with The Exorcist. And then he didn't do all that much after that. And I said, well, you know, he did a lot more than people think. But the other thing our stage manager said, he just said, was he as troubled as he looked? I have never in my life seen such an intense-looking person. I actually sort of knew him before we met. My agent at the time said, there's a production, and I really want you to try out for it. And he said, Jason Miller's producing it. And I said, oh, oh, well, maybe that, that would be really fun then. And we started seeing each other. And it was very much off and on, very much off and on, because, you know, he was off all sorts of places. I sort of didn't always know what was going on with his life personally, and I kind of didn't want to ask. One particular time, he said, you've turned your back on the theater. You know, in that deep voice, that kind of deep, smoky, sexy voice he had. And I just sort of went, what? And I said, Jason, I just got an Emmy nomination, you know, because I'm working here. And, and he goes, you're not writing. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. I think in a way he was yelling at himself. You know, he was angry at himself for not writing enough. That championship season became, you know, his, his little gem. And he asked me to do a film of it. And I agreed to do it largely because of my affection for him. I was walking through an airport one time, and, <laughs> and this wonderful lunatic was on a payphone as, as I was walking by. Hey, he says, I, I got to talk to you. I, I got to talk. Hey, hang on. No, wait, wait. And I said, oh, all the best. Yes, okay, all the best. No, 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 I, I got to talk. Will you hang on? No, no, I'll be right before you. And he, and he ran up to me. He says, I, I've, got a, uh, 
I've got a, a, a play that you must do. Uh, we're going to do the film of it, and uh, you, you have to play this part. And I said, all, uh, okay, all, what's your name? He said, uh, Jason, uh, Jason Miller. I have to get back on the phone. <laughs> That's how we met. We lived very near each other, and I would see him a lot. And he had a place up at the beach, and he was getting his life together, you know. And uh, he was determined to get his film going. And uh, at one point, we were underway uh, with George C. Scott playing the coach. George went to a meeting with the uh, director at that time, who was uh, Billy Freakin, and they didn't see eye to eye. And so the whole project just disappeared. And I felt so bad uh, for Jason, as well as myself. And then suddenly it was resurrected again, and William Holden was going to play it, the coach. And oh gosh, we were excited about that. And uh, we had a wonderful first uh, reading. And, and we were scheduled to meet again to have some further discussions. And uh, he didn't show up. Then the news came later that day that uh, he had died. And that was a big shock. Suddenly, out of the blue, he calls me and says, uh, we're going to do uh, the movie, and I'm going to direct it, and um, Bob Mitchum is going to play the coach. Uh, what do you think about that? And uh, I think it was six or eight weeks later, we were on location in Scranton. We actually shot it in Scranton. Today, it just makes a great pleasure. Realize it's been a long time since I've been back here the last time because uh, I've had some bad luck with the film. But thank God this time it's running smoothly and we have it together. And the cast is all signed. Bruce Dern, Martin Sheehan, Robert Mitchum, uh, Paul Servino and Stacy Keach. And we were to start shooting Monday uh, within Scranton and uh, the area. One take four. It was like as if Hollywood had exploded on Jackson Street in West Grand. And Jason, he was in the center of everything. And like everybody wanted to see him. It was man, woman, child, dog, you name it, everybody was there. The crowds were there and they were yelling and screaming, Jason, Jason, we have to go back and do it again because it ruined the sound, you know. He was the hometown kid made good. We oh, have, excuse oh, me, excuse me. We're me. trying to clear this area here. Do you mind? <laughs> What's this? Hey, officer. Excuse me very this much. This guy out of here, will you? Listen, huh? This guy's me. always hanging around. I, I just have to watch out for excesses and shape it and make suggestions here and there in terms of rhythm and pace because they're they're probably the best cast uh, assembled for a movie in a long time. I would say that if there were one thing that you could judge Jason Miller's career and life as two different things but rolled into one, that championship season is Jason Miller. I love this city. You know why I love this city? Because I love the people of this city. I was born here. Right over there in West Scranton, that's where I Actually, when I was writing the play, a lot of images came into my mind, and I began to think seriously of making a movie. And at that time, I felt a, a crucial element would be an examination of the town that they lived in. And the final conclusion, of which I was never in doubt, the, the sixth character in the play, if you will, should be Scranton, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Anticipation and excitement filled this Waldorf Astoria hotel room as a small group of family and friends gathered with director Jason Miller a few hours before the world premiere of his movie. It's good to uh, finally get it done, and it's nice to have all the Scranton people around, too, and my mom. Now that it's over and it's all together, how do you feel about it? you feel good about it? Yeah, I feel very good about it. I think it's a fine film with incredible performances, uh, beautiful music, uh, we've gotten so far the advance word from the Daily News and Newsweek have been very good reviews. The movie 
opened in New York in 1982. After nearly eight years of setbacks, Jason finally had his film. On the stage, it was very powerful. But the film, it was not uh, a box office success. But I felt badly for Jason because I knew it was a big opportunity for him. I don't know that he made it ever to be a movie. He wrote it to be a play, you know, and I liked it. Uh, just unfortunately, the audience was never caught up with, you know, and, and Sports Illustrated, which we needed a good review from, didn't give us a good review. Once Championship Season came out and sort of went by the boards, it then became very difficult for him to say, okay, what do I do now? We hit a Grand Slam home run first time up. It's hard to get up and just, you know, just get a base hit now. Just get, you know, I, I think it ate him up. I really do. And I know it did. After a while, it was starting to become an albatross. And like everybody else, you wish you had six months to do it and six months to edit it. But when they, when the time came, I took it and it's done. And uh, I feel now I can get on to other work. I, it, it, it bothered me because it was being passed around in Hollywood and it was being abused. I don't like my material abused. It wasn't being respected. It was played with and monkeyed with. So that you know, at times I can get, you know, I got into homicidal rages. And so this time it came by. And uh, it's high tide before you know it, so I uh, took it. You know, I, I think that what I try to do is get is 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 use it to to uh, observe a human condition. That's all, without any kind of judgment. And uh, but God, it's a judgmental world. I'll tell you. You know. He told me that he left California because he was doing a uh, week's worth of drugs on Monday morning, and he was dying. And he got a truck and he backed all it, all it, packed all his furniture and drove it to a cliff and dumped it and came back to Scranton to try and save himself. Many people who knew and loved him uh, felt that it was not a good idea for him to have moved back to Scranton because we felt that he was uh, too comfortable. He could get away with too much. There was not enough responsibility there for him to take for himself, for his talent. When Jason came back to Scranton, he was received like a hero. I remember riding in the back seat of my parents' station wagon, passing him on the street when my mom pointed him out. He seemed both larger than life and weighted down by some anguish that I was too young to understand. I have no doubt that Jason loved Scranton and probably found solace in his return but I can't imagine that he actually felt like a hero. I mean, just the aura of just having somebody of his stature be here, and to be sitting in the same bar at a place, a little place like this. I couldn't believe that when they first said that Jason Miller comes here. You gotta be kidding me. I mean, the actor? Yeah, the actor. Wow. It was, I was just knocked over. I said, I couldn't believe that. And the first time I saw him here, Oh my God, that's Jason Miller, you know? I mean, I just jump up and down, but I said, wow, that's pretty neat, you know? It's, I actually see somebody famous. And once the novelty of him coming back here kind of wore off, and you would just walk downtown and he'd be in this bar or that bar or that bar, it was, oh, Jason's here, but no. No, he didn't have to perform. He didn't have to be an actor. He didn't have to be a writer. He just had to be the guy at the bar. Yeah. 
And if somebody didn't know him, they wouldn't even believe that he was the actor. He'd come in very, very casual. I'm talking about casual, casual. He was more than casual. <laughs> Sometimes you would think he was a street person, you know, uh, uh, the way he dressed. Uh, a little rough, but uh, he, was a, he was a good guy. In the mid-'80s, Scranton's economy was in serious decline. Jason moved right into the center of town. He wanted to help bring Scranton back to life. He became the artistic director of Scranton Public Theater and started a theater festival. He used to say to me, come on, Bob, we'll use the trinkets. The trinkets being the Tony, the, you know, the, the uh, Pulitzer Prize, to get to where we need to go. Let's use them. Two cities and two communities and two counties are coming together to create a, a cultural uh, festival that will entertain and benefit us all. But it is our creation, the creation of Northeastern Pennsylvania. It's not imported because we don't need to import anything here. We just have that talent must be made aware of itself and given an opportunity to work. That's all, really. So uh, I don't, the casting won't be a problem for us at all. Rain and mudslides, that'll, that'll do us in. Their first production was that championship season, with Jason playing the coach. Line it up, shape it, 20 laps around the room. The plot involves five men from Scranton who spend their lives clinging to their most glorious moment. So we can keep the old gunner down either. You gotta change it 20 years. Yeah, come on, let's get that man. You gotta get that line in there, Bob. We'll hang you all hung here. Since winning a basketball championship 24 years earlier, they've slipped into oblivion. Their marriages have failed. One suffers from alcoholism. Another faces the ruin of his career. <laughs> you were a legend in your time, boys. A legend. In the end, the coach turns out to be a fraud. No lightning, no lightning, no lightning, no lightning. When asked once which character Jason resembled most, he said, all of them. The theater was packed on opening night, and just as the play began, the theater was struck by lightning. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up, please. We're gonna give you a performance tonight, come hell or high water. You came out here, we're gonna give you one. All we're waiting for is the rain to stop. We'll do it in the house lights if we have to. We're about ready to start, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats once more, dear friends. Send the actors on stage, please. The Greeks made their men into gods. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. A man who knows the great enthusiasms and the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, and if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Now that's a man's words, boys. That is a great man's words, a man among men. I remember Mr. Miller's first play so well that I never expected to be seeing his second. Uh, well. <laughs> and this review, I mean, this is just amazing. And of course, he did have a wonderful cast. It was led, I think, by Paul Sorvino. Mm -hmm. But um, it, was a, it was an extraordinarily good cast. And um, it was an infinitely better play. And of course, it got raves all around. It, uh, you know, every, everyone, everyone loved it, you know. I mean, it, it was never an imperishable masterpiece. It was never going to be, you know, a play that was going to go down into the records, the, you know, American dramatic literature. But it was um, a good, popular, crowd-pleasing play. I think the surprising thing is that he never really followed up on that. Everyone thinks that people who don't fulfill what they think they ought to have fulfilled is somehow uh, completely unhappy and and all that so i i hope that jason was was 
even though he didn't fulfill what other people thought he should have fulfilled, I hope he was kind of happy. He might have been. I think it's worth, I think it's worth questioning that. He might have, he might have enjoyed the idea of, you know, the boy who could have been but never was. I don't think it's a bad thing. We, we always expect too much of the people we idolise. Sometimes I would just sit there and watch him walk down the street, and he just, you could tell he was somewhere else, you know what I mean? You, you look at him, and you could just see that his head was somewhere else, and he'd be walking, and he, 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 he wasn't there, you know what I mean? Like, he was going through the motions of life, but his mind was somewhere else. He's a good dude. I miss him. He'd say, well, you know, how did you stop drinking, Malachi? You know, I'd say, well, the thing is this, Jason. Do you see this arm? Yes. And I'd say, well, now, if you don't bend it, would a drink? That's how you stop drinking. Don't bend your elbow. And um, I see, he would say, not seeing. And away we'd go again. Then he would ask me again, and he'd get the same answer. So it was hard for him. It was very hard for him. And, I mean, I know it because, I mean, you know, being a recovering alcoholic myself, but it was the only way I could do it. Otherwise, I'd be dead myself. It was Mother's Day. Uh, I was walking back to the kitchen, and my friend Noreen goes, Michael, you better come here quick. He dropped his head back, and held his chest and, and, and Dana was like, I, I don't know what's wrong, he was talking and then that was it. So we immediately tried to get him out onto the floor and, uh, and resuscitate him. It was a hard thing. But you know, every time uh, Dana would try to clear his airway and then we would, we would, we would give him CPR as best we could while we're waiting for the, the emergency crew to come. It just wasn't working. It's a hard, it's a hard day to talk about. Do you think that it was to his detriment that Jason came back? I think the same thing would have happened to him whether he was here or whether he was somewhere else. I think it was probably a lot easier for him being here. It's home. It's home. That's why it feels so, that's why it's so appealing. You know what I mean? Especially Jason being in the heart of West Side. You know what I mean? That's the first part of Scranton. It's the oldest part of Scranton. You know, I mean, it's just, it's home. And, and that's a very appealing thing. Nothing feels like home. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for being here. We're here to honor a great friend of all of ours who unfortunately passed away way before his time. But here today, we are unveiling something that I feel will preserve his memory forever.
more information on this program, visit itvs.org. Major funding was provided for Miller's Tale by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by 